All right. Uh, really quickly, my name's Kelsey. I work for Gales Creek Camp Foundation um, in the office all year round. And then I get to hop out to camp during the summer uh, to hang out with cool people like our camp director, Boo, who's here tonight. Um, but I am going to actually pass it over to our hope mongering host, Kendra, who's going to introduce our topic and our special guest. Great. Thanks, Kelsey. My name's Kendra Lodewick, and I am um, a parent of three kids with type one, all of whom have gone to um, Gales Creek Camp or and now have also worked at Gales Creek Camp. So um, uh, we are um, a big part of the community and really happy to be a part of this hope mongering. Um, and I'm happy to introduce tonight Derek Duman, who Derek was diagnosed with type one when he was 14. Um, because tonight we're talking about sports and type one. He grew up playing a lot of sports between golf and basketball and football. Um, and then he has continued sports through college. He was a manager of the United of the University of Portland's men's basketball team. And he's now a high school educator, coaching high school golf, girls basketball, boys basketball, football, and soccer. So you name it, he's doing it. Um, he's currently the athletic director for the Riverdale School District in Portland. And he's also been a coach out of the Chris Dudley basketball camp um, for six years, working with kids with type one. So some of you may be familiar with that camp as well. Um, so he's going to talk to us about kind of his experience, um, you know, potentially as a as an athlete with um, type one, but also as a coach and on kind of the like the coaching and, and education and administrative end of it, too. So I'm excited for what he has to share with us. And then we will have time for questions and conversation afterwards. Um, and Derek, if I've omitted anything, you should. Add, add to the story before you start too. Well, thank you, Kendra, Kelsey, uh, Boo, and, and those of you that have uh, joined the call today. Uh, super excited to be here. Uh, my name is Derek Duman. I've, I've been involved in sports my entire life. And uh, actually this last weekend celebrated my 18th anniversary. So uh, that's kind of exciting. Uh, my, uh, my diabetes is graduating high school this year. They, they just grow up so fast, you know, it's amazing. So, uh, but thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, uh, I'm really humbled to be asked to talk about this. Um, when I think of, uh, things that have impacted my life in a positive way, um, the top two things are, are honestly sports and type one diabetes. And so I'm, I'm very passionate about, about both and excited to kind of share, uh, my experiences. Uh, I grew up the son of two coaches, uh, so sports were were always going to be in my in my life in my future. Um, and I started uh, from a very young age, probably as early as you could have playing basketball, soccer, anything I could I could do, um, and then continued throughout high school. And although I didn't play uh, college sports, I was involved uh, in college sports and participated in some intramurals and stuff. Uh, and then I'm in my 11th year as a high school educator, uh, as Kendra kind of mentioned. So uh, the last 10 years have been of a teacher and coach, and, and now in my first year as an athletic director. Um, I want to start by uh, sharing my diagnosis story, which actually naturally would involve sports. Uh, that's uh, the purpose the shoe fits, I guess. Um, so my freshman year of high school, uh, I broke my collarbone in my very first high school football game. Uh, which meant I spent the entire football season out, uh, not able to participate. And um, <clears throat> my, uh, I went into basketball tryouts. So it would have been this week, actually, um, however long ago that was, um, and noticed some really severe cramping in my legs. So, I mean, the first, within the first 30 minutes, I was really having a hard time uh, moving, uh, getting, bending my knees, getting into a stance. Uh, so I went to our athletic trainer um, and he did all his voodoo magic that he could possibly try um, and none of it worked. And I ended up uh, going to the doctor where uh, they took a urine sample. Uh, I had a extremely large amount of urine uh, in my, or excuse me, sugar in my urine, uh, not urine in my sugar. That's not good. Uh, sugar in my urine uh, and uh, was diagnosed uh, on a, on a Friday night. Um, which was pretty shocking to me and my family. Uh, we have no history of diabetes in the family. And uh, obviously my parents were quite concerned what that was going to look like. Uh, went in on Friday, came out on Sunday afternoon and went back to school on, on Monday with uh, a, whole, a whole new life ahead of me. 
Um, in that first month after diagnosis, I gained 20 pounds um, and kind of started to feel normal again. Um, all the telltale signs, drinking a lot of water, constant urination, um, not gaining weight um, were all things that um, I know now, right? But didn't know at the time. Um, and uh, thankfully we caught it. And, uh, and here I am today. Um, I did um, my, during baseball season, I was kind of finally healthy and doing things well, but I found out I was having trouble uh, tracking the ball when it was hit off the bat, which uh, if you've ever played baseball, softball or any racket sport is concerning because um, the ball oftentimes projectiles towards you. Uh, and so we went to the eye doctor and found out that I actually had cataracts uh, at 14 years old. And so uh, I had cataract surgery uh, that summer. Um, I was the youngest patient in the room. I think the oldest was 95. So uh, Gladys and I got along well, uh, shared life stories. It was fantastic. Um, and so uh, that's kind of my, my diagnosis story and how it has affected multiple sports um, within my life. I want to first kind of share uh, my experiences playing sports uh, with diabetes. Um, I'm assuming people on the call have, have children that are um, either doing that now or potentially interested in doing that. Um, and my first comment on it is that it's, it's like anything else with diabetes. It's completely doable, uh, but probably just a little bit harder, right? So um, I'm, I was able to participate in any and all sports that I wanted to, but it took a little extra work uh, on my end. Um, and, and kind of my advice, uh, I'm not a doctor, not a medical doctor, so don't take any medical information from me as, as uh, the gospel by any means, but um, my suggestion is one, have a plan, right? So when, uh, when I would go low, I had Gatorade readily available, right? So my parents would send me with it or I'd make sure I had it in my bag. Uh, my coaches knew where that was, my teammates knew where that was. Um, so make sure you have a plan. Um, the other thing that really helped me was getting into a routine, right? So if I knew I had a game at seven, uh, maybe pregame meal was at four o'clock, uh, I would test my blood sugar as we got closer to the game. Uh, and maybe I needed a fruit snack before or a granola bar. Um, and I kind of got into that routine. And when I was in that routine, things worked out pretty well for me. Uh, and so uh, have a plan. Uh, and then find find a routine. Um, I think the other thing in consultation with doctors is to figure out where uh, your your child feels most comfortable uh, competing, right? So for me personally, um, I felt a little more comfortable running a little high. So between 160 and 240 is actually where I wanted to be during competition. If I was at 100, right, I hit that unicorn number. Um, right before a game, I would actually treat because I knew that I was going to drop during competition. Um, and again, that's me personally. Um, I guess I should note that um, I was playing sports before Dexcom. Um, I think maybe the company was around, but it wasn't uh, what it is today. So I didn't have a CGM on me. Um, I was coming over the sideline to test uh, helping your child, obviously, the younger they are, the, maybe the harder that is, right? What's comfortable to a third grader? They don't know half the time, but trying to figure out maybe when that is uh, or what that is for them. Uh, and then for me, right, my crash typically happened an hour after competition, right? So even though I might be riding 240 after a game, um, I figured out pretty quickly that that was not the time to correct, right? Because it was going to come down. Um, it was just a matter of time. And again, that's getting into having your plan. What are you going to do afterwards? Do you, do you treat right away? Uh, do you wait? You know, some kids crash in the middle of the game. Other, you know, my personal, I, I crashed after. Uh, and so as you kind of get into it and figure it out, um, finding out what works best and having that plan um, is, is kind of my suggestion for kids that are playing with diabetes. And, and as parents, right, the younger your kids are, probably the more involved you're going to have to be. Um, I was 14 when I started playing uh, sports with diabetes. And so I was probably a little more self-sufficient than if I had been in third grade, right? So those things are also uh, things you should, should take into account. The next thing I kind of want to talk about is uh, working with my teammates. So I think 
um, a lot of diabetics are worried about the stigma of having diabetes, right? Like, what is it? Um, the misconceptions about diabetes are insane. Um, it's, it's hard for me to correct people every single time they make a wrong assumption. How were my peers going to treat me now that I had this disease, right? How are they going to see me? Um, am I no longer going to be cool? Whether I was cool in the first place is up for debate, but right, how is that going to affect my social status and amongst my teammates, right? Like, are they going to be able to rely on me in game situations and what does that look like? And so um, in my experience, my teammates were incredibly curious. Um, and that's probably not going to be the case for every kid. Uh, but I had my teammates ask me a lot of questions like, what is it? How do you treat it? What's going on? Right. What's a high blood sugar? What's a low blood sugar? Um, and answering those questions honestly. Right. And telling them like, hey, I can do the same things you can do. Um, I just how I do that might look different. Right. I might not be able uh, when I come over to the side, I might have to test my blood sugar or eat a granola bar. You might not have to do that. Right. But that helps me be on the same playing field as you and and compete at the same level as you do um and then uh ex explaining to them <clears throat> you know what happens when i go low right what is that what is that doing to my body and why might i have to sit out in a drill and then the last thing i had down that i wanted to talk about is i would imagine at a younger level right um, the diabetic kid gets to bring snacks to games right and uh and he's got the fruit snacks in the bag and trying to help those teammates understand like those aren't like free for all fruit snacks, right? It's not movie night here uh, on the bench. Those are things that are gonna help me um, when needed, you know, they're uh, medical medical supplies. And uh, you probably get some funny looks when you tell kids that fruit snacks are medical supplies, but they are, right? For diabetics, that's what they are. Um, and just having an understanding of like, hey, you can't steal my fruit snacks, um, but just kind of that, uh, education of your teammates, um, because I do think some of them will be naturally curious, um, and, and just making sure they understand uh, what the misconceptions are, uh, and explaining to them why you have to sit out every once in a while, um, hoping that that happens as little as possible. Next thing uh, that I want to talk about, and I think it's it's hard sometimes, I would imagine as parents and even as a player, um, was talking to your coaches, right? So. Um, I would tell you that um, every coach that I've been around um, as a fellow coach, uh, as a player, as an athletic director, uh, every coach wants kids to succeed. Uh, I, I haven't met a coach that is like, yeah, I don't want that kid to be successful or I'm going to I'm going to ruin that kid's career. Right. I think sometimes as parents, they might feel that way or the kid feel your kid feels that way when they come home. Uh, but I've never met a coach uh, that has done that. Um, and so, but I'll also tell you that coaches that aren't familiar with diabetes are going to be really nervous, right? Uh, because there's a lot of things that are going through their mind. Um, and if they don't know or understand, um, they're going to be a little nervous about how to, because they're going to think that your child is different, right? Because they have diabetes and they're going to have to do these things somehow differently. And there's a little bit of truth to that, right? There's going to be things that, that you need to help educate the coach on, uh, going back to those misconceptions being the first one, um, but helping them understand that, you no, know, your child with diabetes can do all the same things the kids without diabetes can do. Um, but there's just some things that they have to be aware of, right? Um, so teaching them is important. What I would encourage as well is how can you have your child help in that education process, if that makes sense. So uh, obviously it's harder if your child is, is really young, right? Your kid doesn't even really know what's going on with diabetes. So as the parent, you're gonna have to take that lead. But if your kid is you know, getting into the middle school or high school level, right? That's a great way to build self-confidence in your, in your athlete. Um, and help them educating their coach because that helps build that relationship as well. That's going to help them throughout that season or multiple seasons with that coach. Um, it also helps. Uh, I don't think my guess is you don't want to be the parent that's always nagging the coach, right? Nobody wants to be that parent. And I would assume diabetic parents feel like you're that way because you're having to help educate and do those things. 
And so trying to help go through that, that player, the athlete uh, can help you hopefully feel a little more comfortable um, or at least doing it in conjunction with, uh, with your, with your child. Some big things I would encourage you to talk to your coaches about. Um, the first one is what, what are the low symptoms for your child? So every diabetic is different. Their low symptoms are completely different, right? Um, I, my brain gets ahead of my, my mouth when I get low, right? So like I start talking slower because my brain is moving faster than my mouth. Um, I also think I announced my candidacy for mayor one time when I was really low. So weird things start coming out of my mouth, okay? Um, that might not be how your kid acts when they're low, but notifying the coach what to look for is going to help empower the coach support your kid, right? So if your kid um, starts looking off into space or gets, you know, super flush or whatever those things that you know are your kid's low symptoms, and helping make sure that the coach knows those things are gonna really help empower them to support your child. Uh, and so I would strongly encourage you to make sure you tell them what they are, okay? The other thing is making sure they know where treatment is, right? So when they do get a, a low blood sugar, where, where are the gummy snacks? Where is the Gatorade? Where is the apple juice? Um, helping uh, make sure they know where that treatment is, whether you have it, your kid has it, uh, they know where to access that. And then the other suggestion I would have with communicating with your coach is creating some sort of signal or sign um, to um, let the coach know when either your kid is low or having your kid notify them when they're low, right? So kind of a common universal sign when someone needs a break is to tap their head in the world of sports, right? So maybe tapping the head isn't a good one, but maybe they pull their ear or they, you know, touch their nose. There could be some sort of sign that your kid or you maybe um, give the coach to let them know that that's happening. Um, the suggestion, that suggestion is, is more to help uh, your kid as well, right? Because the last thing kids want, especially grade school, middle school, high school, um, is to maybe make a big deal about diabetes. Not all of them are comfortable doing that. And so that might be a, an incognito way, right, for everybody to be on the same page and make sure that they're able to take care of what they need to um, in those situations. Um, the last couple of things I want to talk about um, is kind of some of my experience coaching diabetics. Um, every diabetic is different. Uh, I'm pretty open with my diabetes. Uh, as an educator, I enjoy educating others on diabetes and what that looks like and, and how I can do all of these really cool things with diabetes, all the same things that non-diabetics can do. But not everybody's like that. Um, and so uh, in my experience, the kids knowing that I was there for them and ready to assist them, I think was really huge for them. That was the support they needed. That might be the support your child needs, right? They might not need uh, a coach that's, that's gonna go um, you know, back to nursing school to learn about diabetes, right? That's not maybe what needs to happen. But as I kind of mentioned previously, right? If they uh, can have that connection with the coach where when they go to them, the coach knows where things are, they're ready to do that. Um, that's sometimes all a diabetic kid needs to be successful, right? And I've coached kids uh, like that, where uh, we had good relationships, but, you know, they and I knew when something was needed, right? And they would ask me to get the granola bar or uh, me to get the fruit snacks. Um, and it can be not a big demonstrative thing. And that's okay. Um, funny story. Um, I like, I like to tell is one time, um, I, my, uh, insulin pump, uh, just stopped working. Uh, it was at halftime of a football game and, uh, I had a, a diabetic football player on the team and, uh, he, uh, thankfully had some extra insulin in his bag. And I did not have a plan, bad diabetic coaching on my part, but he did and had some insulin, um, that he was able to lend me for, for that night so that I didn't, uh, end up being in a, in a whole, a whole lot of trouble. Um, and he knows that I would have done the same for him, right? Diabetics look out for each other, but, um, it's, it's kind of fun. Uh, it was a fun experience to coach diabetics, 
um, and kind of create that relationship. Maybe we weren't best buds, but uh, you know, we were dia buddies, if that makes sense, right? And we were able to, to help each other out. Um, and, and that was a really cool experience for me as a coach. I've had similar experiences at the Chris Dudley basketball camp, um, coaching kids with type one diabetes, right? And then my last spiel for the night, and then we'll go to questions, um, is just that there are tons of success stories of type one diabetes and sports, right? There are multiple people that have played in the NBA, um, Jordan Morris, um, is on the United States men's soccer team that's competing in the World Cup starting next week. Uh, he's a type 1 diabetic, and he's playing in the, the highest level soccer uh, in the world, right? And so um, I think hopefully we know that. I don't think that can be said enough. Um, but for me, uh, anytime I can and share that with kids is, right, if your kid wants to be a sports star, not all of them will, and that's okay. Um, but if they want to, they can do that. Diabetes is not going to prevent them from doing that. Um, just like it's not going to prevent them from being a CEO or climbing uh, Mount Everest if they want to, right? All of those things are achievable. Um, it just takes a little extra work um, because our pancreas doesn't. Uh, I think that is um, most of what I wanted to talk about. I'm sure there's plenty of questions uh, as a coach, I, I tend to ramble, so I apologize if I, if I did that uh, in any way, but um, yeah, that's, open it up for questions. Yeah, that's great, Derek. Thank you. Um, lots of really good experience and, and tips from your, your own experience, both as an athlete and, and as a coach and as a supporter. So um, any, any questions from the group, from parents that are on to start, start us off? Um, I, I mean, I think the, the, the pressure of letting down your team is, I mean, it's real, right? Like you are um, doing all the same things they are, right? You're growing to rely on them as they're growing to rely on you. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's hard when diabetes doesn't let you compete. Um, and, and I wish there was a way that that didn't happen, right? Like there's no perfect uh, answer to that question. Um, and, and in my bout with diabetes, um, it feels like right when I got it figured out, kind of like you were mentioning, it, all of a sudden it changes, right? Like it just it changes at random times and it's extremely frustrating um, and can be very inconvenient at times. And uh, there's not much uh, that we can do about it. That's, that's life with diabetes. And uh, my, my hope would be, you know, in those situations that you can or she can build, you know, that relationship with her teammates and that, that understanding of like, Hey, it pains me when this has to happen, right? Like, and I'm, I'm hoping that her teammates would see that on her face. Like she wants to be out there and understanding that this really is out of her control, right? It's, it's in her control to a certain extent, but, um, there's not much she can do. And, and it, it takes, uh, so, you know, in terms of the hating to miss out, I think that's, that's natural. Um, and you're going to, you're going to do everything you can. She's going to do everything she can. Um, to be in the game in the moments that she's needed. For me, it was a lot of trial error, right? Because there are some late nights. Um, you know, bus rides are even worse, right? I mean, it's like you finish, I'm thinking, you know, we played a game in Klamath Falls. I grew up in Eugene, right? And so the game's over at 930 um, we might get, you know, it might be a Big Mac is what I got on the way home, which is not the best post game, but that's what you had. That's what, that was the option. Um, and yeah, it was a little bumpy, um, in terms of what, what that, what that would look like. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of it's trial and error. A lot of it too is, <clears throat> is sometimes the feel of your, your kid, like what, what, what are they feeling? They kind of have to feel out that diabetes and what that looks like. Um, and, and it might not be perfect, right? It might be better if they get home at seven o'clock 
but maybe that night, you know, they get home at, you know, midnight, you know, by the time they're off the bus and it, it might not be perfect. And again, I'm not a doctor, but you know, like as diabetics, we have non-perfect nights, you know, there are nights where it's just not good, you know, and we're going to do everything you can in your ability to, to make it as good as possible. Um, but, but you might know on those nights that, okay, tonight's going to be a little rough, right. Or through trial and error, you find ways to minimize the roller coaster, right? Yeah, where it's it's the kitty coaster as opposed to the thrill seeking upside down, right? All over the place trend line uh, that can happen sometimes on those nights. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's trial and error. Um, I I would tell you that I typically would under bolus on those nights, right? So when I came home, if I knew you know, typically I knew I was going to crash, right? So instead of, you know, taking, if I was eating 60 carbs, instead of taking the insulin for the full 60, maybe I would only take it for 40. Okay. Again, don't take medical advice from a, from an educator, but right. That really worked for me and it wasn't perfect, but it would sometimes slow down that crash. Right. So maybe instead of crashing right away, the crash came a little bit later Right. Or at least gave me time to manage, um, manage that up and down as opposed to just boom, I hit the floor hard. And now I'm, you know, just eating Skittles and fruit snacks. And that's not great at 1 a.m. either. Right. So it's it's one of those things I think that's trial and error. But something that I did that helped was I didn't bowl as quite as much because I knew it was coming um, and it, it helped lower the lower the ups and downs um for me but it wasn't perfect and it took some trial and error um and it took some knowing what i was actually putting into my body as well after those after those um those late nights and and being in competition we had we had the same experience with our kids generally i'd say um but like my daughter in particular when she would have soccer soccer had a unique effect that was on, different on her than cross country, like soccer, she would crash like eight hours later. So she would, even if she was home by like six, she would crash. But I should say before that, she would always spike, regardless of what she ate. It's like her blood sugar was just having a post exercise high. And initially, we're like, oh, we should correct for that. Cause like at 11, she'd be really high, not realizing that like it wasn't because anything she ate, it was like a phys physiological response to that exercise. And we could not bolus for it. So we had to be, we had to get comfortable with, she's going to have, she's going to have that swing and you got to wait it out because then she's going to drop fast. And we ended up setting up a separate, um, I don't know if your child is on a pump or not, but we had a, a separate um, profile for her on day she had soccer and it would switch, we'd switch it onto soccer, which it reduced her basal um, tremendously overnight because she hardly needed any, even when she got over that high, she hardly needed anything after that um, to avoid dropping. So it was definitely trial and error. But oh, I noticed that too, sometimes it's not just the lows, but it's sometimes sports brings on, physical activity brings on those highs, those spikes that are about to proceed a drop. And so it's like, you can't, you can't manage those highs the way you would a carb high because there's nothing that's really, there's nothing supporting them. You know, there's no, there's no foundation for those. They're, they're, they're about to, they're about to burst on their own. But um, I think trial and error was the name of the game for sure. So one thing I would add to that, um, I'm David and Boo out at camp. I'm a camp director, but I also coach uh, lacrosse. Um, I've coached middle school athletes, high school athletes all throughout. So one thing I would also try and remind your child is, um, like Derek said earlier, over communicate with that coach, um, let them know, bring them in on it. Like, Hey, like we're trying something new, keep an eye out because there are these adjustments. And then I think it's also especially important at that age of 13 going into high school is athletes change so much in those years. So, um, you know, I have an, I'll have an athlete that, you know, shows up to practice first day of seventh grade and they weigh 85 pounds. And then by the time they're a sophomore in high school, they're now six, four and, you know, 185. So really being aware of, of those changes and how those are going to happen and how that's going to play into it. And then 
again, just the more information, like as a coach, if that player is coming to me and saying, Hey, this is what I'm trying. This is where I'm at, but also this is what I have going on. So, um, you know, I'm finding that I'm really crashing as I'm coming in on the second half, you know, if you can give that insight to that coach, that coach can work with you to kind of put you in better situations. Um, you know, I'm not somebody that lives with diabetes, but I think as a coach, from my perspective, if I'm not putting in my players in the best uh, position to succeed, I'm not doing my job. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, I'm leaving a player in there as they're crashing and they're missing those layups, that's not on them that they're missing that low. It's, it's on me that I'm not helping support them and, and, and kind of help navigate that as well from the coaching side. I, I like that idea, Boo, of um, thinking of the thinking of like when if they're seeing any patterns or are noticing this thinking of it as um as optimizing their strengths versus like focusing on the weakness and so like having that perspective i think is is really useful and could potentially be helpful for the athlete too in both communicating but also internalizing like this is a reality and things like this are going to happen but i'm really strong here and i want to i want to figure out how to i can best contribute to the team on like the times when i am am most able to contribute but it is hard we have um, like i said three kids who are all active in sports and man we we have a lot of years under our belt now and we have not figured it out. And like Derek said, it depends. Every sport is different. Every, I mean, every game is different. The same, you know, same day, different games at different times during a tournament. And then you try the same thing because, you know, you'll, I'm sure you've all done this. Like oh, this worked really well. Let's just have this every time you have a basketball game. And then the next time you do it, it doesn't work. So it's like, there are so many variables that are impacting this. It's and the other thing I think is I'm not sure it depends and depends on the sports too whether our kids keep their pumps on or off and um because some of them are more physical and the pumps can get more damaged and I know that's one thing that one of our kids struggled with is that when he wasn't wearing his pump for games even when he would take his pump off just sitting on the sideline because like you know he's gonna have he could have to go in on a moment's notice and so then he'd potentially be sitting there for 20 minutes without uh, you know and that aggregates over the course of the game and it would mean that every time he came out even for you know three minutes plug back in and just give yourself a unit at least to cover and those are really hard things to be tracking when you're really just trying to be a team player and just trying to focus on the game and instead you're just having to like manage your body the whole time on the side so that is one thing that that I think can be a struggle um and then I think also just feeling like not and I'm curious. I mean, I think I'm. I have the sense from the um, from Derek's comments and and booze too. But I think it's hard for kids when they know that that like letting the team down is definitely real. But also just feeling like, am I not going to get the? Well, I can't think of the word. It's not respect or opportunities. But um, you know, our coach is always going to. Am I always going to be a little bit of a wild card and therefore not not get the same kind of um trust the, is a coach not gonna have the same trust in me as they have in someone else because you know it, it, it's there are these variables that other people don't face and that can be frustrating I know sometimes like our kids struggle you know depending on how friendly their 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 diabetes has been in a day what it's whether they're friends or enemies with it and then but sometimes sports days are like they're they're really angry and I don't blame them like they it can really upset normal play like norm what you typically would be able to do and that I think is one of the more what times when they got most frustrated with being type one is when like it robbed them of opportunities that were so clear and they wouldn't have had in another situation and that that were not only like that are also so short-lived like you have this moment to do this thing and you can't and then that moment's gone in sports and in games and of course there are going to be other games and whatnot but it's not like other activities where you can just like, oh, just wait, give yourself 20 minutes and then do whatever it is you're planning on doing and it'll work out. This is like, it's here or now. And so that can be really frustrating. I mean, I think it's twofold, right? I think one uh, is the communication. I think just building that trust um, with a coach and communicating that I think is, is really important. And, and I think the, you know, the other part of that is, is, is demonstrating, right, that 
uh, you can do it also. And, and, you know, I think <clears throat> we're emphasizing because there are these moments that we're going to miss, right? But I think, in my experience, at least, you know, more times than not, I was able to be in those moments. You know, mm -hmm. there were moments that I missed, right? But most of the time, practically all of the time, uh, I was there and I was ready and I could, I could do it, right? And I think that <clears throat> that happens more times than not. More times than not, your kid in those situations is going to be able to make it happen, right? And I think this is human nature, unfortunately, too, right? We forget sometimes all the positive things that we do, and we harp on the one thing that we don't do well, or the mistake that we made. And it's the same thing with diabetes, right? When we miss that one moment, we're going to harp on that, right? But I think more times than not, if, you're, if your kid is able to be in there and participate in play, right? I think the coach is still going to trust them in those moments, right? And one moment isn't going to define uh, the rest of their sporting career or that their career with that team, right? And I think it's, um, so that would be, that would be my, my comment to that is the communication one, but more times than not, I, I imagine um, the kids aren't low and they're able to participate in those situations. And that's going to help build that trust with that, that coach. Mm -hmm. um, and one time is not going to completely uh, completely ruin that experience or that trust from that coach. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Boo, you can add to that as well, but that's, that's my, my two cents on it. Yeah. I think um, a lot of coaches, when you, when you look at what they really value, um, a lot of coaches would, are going to tell you the same thing. And it's not that their best athletes came in as LeBron James and, you know, walking in at six, eight and can dunk in the, in the seventh grade. Um, one of the, one of the things that really, really builds great athletes is resiliency. And what that's something that um, type ones experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's one of my favorite things about working out at campus. I see this resiliency in these kids who are taking on um, diabetes at a young age and thriving and coming out and being so successful. And like Derek said, they have all these these wins on a daily basis. They focus a lot of times on the on those on those tough moments, but they have all these huge wins. And as an athlete, being resilient and being gritty and determined and persistent is one of the best uh, best qualities you can have. Um, it's those kids that you know the things that the ones I think about are the ones that work their way up to a high level player that that work their way up. They work on their craft. They work on their skill. Um, and those are habits that your children are learning with diabetes because they know it's not perfect. They know they're going to have, you know, a low blood sugar at an inconvenient time, you know, whether it's in a sporting event or in class or on vacation, all those things. Um, so they're really building up that skill that to be honest with you, sometimes it's harder to find in athletes nowadays. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, I don't know that anybody's ever going to see it as an advantage to have type one, but I think it, there are some instances where it's a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if they can apply some of that same mindset that they have with diabetes to the athletic field or vice versa, sometimes of like, Hey, remember when, you know, you didn't have your jump shot and now you're, you're a lot more consistent from the corner three. Hey, remember how, you know, we struggled with making sure we were checking our blood sugar, you know, towards the end of the day. Well, now, you know, we're going to work our way into that. So I think a lot of those skills translate and, and seeing some of that um, will really help, can really help our athletes. And, and those are the qualities that I think coaches really look for um, because they're harder to find than, you know, the fastest kid. It's really easy to look and mm -hmm. see the fastest on sprints, um, but it's a lot harder to find the kid that, you know, wants the big moment or the kid that wants um, to take on that tough assignment defensively or things like that mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I mean those are skills that that I really enjoy in, in athletes so um, and serve them well beyond the athletic field so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll add to that really quickly too um, I will not claim to have been or am an athlete by any means but I did play basketball all through my senior year of high school um, and one thing I was told as I think probably a freshman in high school um, just as advice from someone who gone, who had gone through it was to never let diabetes be the excuse. Um, and that sounds pretty straightforward. Like 
obviously don't say you're low if you're not low just to get out of something. Um, but also I think it meant like going the extra step. So if you happen to be low in practice, when your teammates are having to run lines and you physically cannot be running lines, maybe come into practice early the next day and run those lines. And that just kind of shows not only the coach, but your teammates that you're still in it with them. Diabetes is not taking away from any of that, even though the last thing you want to be doing is running lines. Um, you might not be able to do it right when they're doing it, but you're still doing everything that they're doing. That seems like a really tangible example of, of how to sort of counter some of the, what you may perceive as lost opportunities, not that running lines isn't necessarily perceived as a real opportunity, but an opportunity, like, and also some team solidarity, like regaining some of that team solidarity that sometimes um, type one can disrupt. Yeah. And just quickly to piggyback on what Boo had said, right. In team sports, like part of, part of the lesson we're teaching is that, right. When my teammates not at my best or their best, I, I get to pick up that slack. Right. And that's part of being mm -hmm. on a team. And, and so there are going to be many times when the diabetic kid is actually picking up the slack of the teammate. Right. And so part of being a great teammate is picking up that slack when they do go low or they're not playing their best. And that's, that's part of part of team sports. Yeah, that's a really good point, Derek, because it feels like um, everyone has off days and off moments in a game and they're maybe less, less um, tangible or identifiable, but you can feel off or just, I mean, I think of how many times I go for a run and I'm like, wow, my legs felt like lead and I don't have type one to excuse it. But um, people in game and, and games have those up and downs too. And I think one of the hard parts is that it's so much easier to identify and you need to identify it with type one. So it's clear, whereas like other teammates, maybe, you know, they're needing support or, you know, you're picking up their slack on a more organic basis without it being like, a, without them having to say like, I need you to do this or I'm low and and that's good to keep in mind that it is an organic, like mutual um, um, relationship between all the teammates and that even though type people with type one have probably are much more conscious and aware of when those moments are for them, the other teammates are having them in their own ways too, in maybe not as explicit ways, but they're having it, they're, they're, everyone's lifting each other up at other times in their own way too. And that's that's a good reminder. Well, thank you so much, Derek and Boo for sharing your expertise from the coaching and athletes perspective. And thank you all for joining us. 